As a self-proclaimed doctor and her bodyguard, we have an easy commute. All we have to carry is a simple box with the medical fees collected from the patients. Or perhaps I should say victims. Yoru carries the box on the way to work while it's still light, and I carry the box on the way back home when it gets heavy, if business is good. I'm carrying the box right now. We're pretty tired, but it's not exactly because we worked hard or anything. In any case, after work, we get back to the apartment and stop in front of the door to our room. The lock's been hacked open with an axe or something. Even the knob's been torn off. It makes me sad just looking at it. All this time, I've never even thought about how a door might feel. Yoru turns to me and looks me in the eyes without a word. I nod to tell her I know. I then kick down the door as hard as I can. And before the door can hit the floor, I pull a gun out of my coat and shoot through it once, then again, and again. No response. I then throw the collection box at the ceiling in the room. When the box hits the ceiling, it explodes into a shower of coins. A voice says, whoa, but it's neither my voice nor yours. Thanks for giving away your position. You see, I was only trying to get a bunch of coins on the floor so that if you stepped on one, it would make a sound that would alert me to your position. So you just saved me the trouble, I guess. The rest is simple. This happens every day, after all. Every day. I rush over and fire a shot at the crown of his head. Speed is key. Just like it is with our commute to work. When I turn around, not only is Yoru standing there, but so are Pacifica and Anya. I vaguely wave to them. Anya says, what's up with that? While Pacifica waves back. It is what it is, I reply. As a self-proclaimed doctor and her bodyguard, we have an easy commute. But lately, I've got a heavy heart. Must be a pain. Things are going fine at first, though. We've been worrying about something lately. And that's the fact that assailants attack us on the way back from work every day. <laughs> the priest definitely has something to do with it. He's barging into kids' rooms? I know he's a father, but he's not a dad. Here, coffee's ready. Yoru slams coffee cups onto the table, making more noise than necessary. The rims of each cup are slightly chipped. I suppose it's only to be expected, considering the cupboard containing the cups was recklessly toppled over during the home invasion. The room was dirty to begin with, but it's my only home, and now that the enemy has invaded it, it's no longer a safe place. It's a pain indeed. I stare at the rim of my cup to distract myself from the man's corpse still on the floor. This place is home to many memories. I can't say they're all good memories, but they're irreplaceable. And now, it feels like those memories were tainted. But perhaps this is my fault, it probably is. It's because of my improper methods. I don't know what that... I don't know what they call themselves, but he must be in that worthless group of hoodlums who eat sweets around the clock. So he's not with the church? Well, yes and no. The church's power runs deep and wide both economically and physically. Almost every business, association, and even hobby club runs with the support of the church if you trace the chain of command far enough. Whether the people at the bottom of the chain know it or not, they're financially backed by the church. The assailants attacking you are probably doing so under the orders of some scumbag boss. Either that boss or that boss's boss is probably under orders from the church. So that's why they can do these things without batting an eyelid. And there's also the fact that other organizations wouldn't have any reason to target you. I feel bad. Her explanation is simple and logical, but if it's true, then there's nowhere to run. I guess you need a sturdier door, huh? 
We've saved up a bit of money, so if you could set us up, I'd appreciate it as quickly as possible. Well, I'm not sure how much I can fudge the schedule personally, but I can manage before long. How long is before long, exactly? Well, it won't take 9,999 days, that's for sure. That's not before long at all. I shout louder than I expected, but the one I spooked the most with that shout was most definitely myself. I'm not mad or anything, just a little tired, to be honest. Sayako, don't worry. Most of the clients at her workshop are my referrals, so I can help these up the line just a bit. What you need to do right now is to bear with it just a little while longer. And that's something only you can do, so... Look, this guy's got three magazines on him. Please don't show me that. I don't know when Yoru started frisking the body, but she speaks up after finding something. All of the assassins have been armed with a variety of weapons. Looting weapons from the bodies helps us build an arsenal, and hopefully should serve as a deterrent as the enemy realizes they're just handing us more and more weapons. But there's no need to do that right now, is there? You think I frisk dead bodies for fun? Tell Sayako you're sorry for being a shitty, inconsiderate dumbass. I'm sorry for being a shitty, inconsiderate dumbass. Well said. Wouldn't you agree, Sayako? Sayako, I'm not you, I can't speak for you, and I don't know how it feels to be targeted by assassins every day. But I swear I'll track down the culprit for you. So please bear with it until then. You don't have to do anything else, just bear with it. That's your job right now. Just trust it. I think Pacifica is strong. Far stronger than me. And she's right. You aren't me. I trust you. Well said. I give you a hundred out of a hundred. Satisfied, Pacifica lets go of Yoru before leaving with Anya. Without me even saying anything, the two of them pick up the corpse and give me a nod, as if to say, leave the rest to us. Once they're gone, I clean up the wrecked, coin-strewn room and murmur to myself. I sure hope I can bear with it. Usually, we talk about the patience of the day before going to sleep, but today, we're deathly quiet. We still feel slightly reserved around each other, and we don't have much to do or talk about, so we simply get ready for bed. Sorry about earlier. I've been a little weird today, or rather, these past few days. Everyone is a little bit weird. It's something I've been saying to my patients a lot lately. I see. That's reassuring. Yeah. After that short conversation, I turn off the lights. I wake up to the sound of the doorbell. Who could it be this late at night? Uh, I mean, this close to dawn? Door repair? No, it's way too soon for that. Package delivery. For a second, I wish Yuri would get it, but she's dead asleep, even more dead than a ghost, with her leg entangled around mine. Yoru's pajamas are so unbuttoned, she's practically not even wearing them. I chuckle to myself, because I've grown so used to seeing her like that, it doesn't even faze me. Tomorrow is going to be like any other day. I'll talk with Yoru, and we'll go to work together. I slip on my slippers and slip out of bed. There's a slight crack in the hastily duct-taped door. It's dark in the room and bright in the hall. I can see someone standing outside without even having to get close to the crack. Those boots are familiar. They're the same ones worn not by today's assailant, but an earlier one. And he's got a pretty heavy package with him. Whenever I loot a gun from our assailants, I toss it under our bed. If we just reach in, I'll find what I need. Ah, there we go. For just a moment, I'll worry if I wake up Yoru. Well, whatever. I'll be right there. I pulled the trigger. Yoru doesn't wake up. I just hear a groan from across the door. I kick the door open and head into the hall. I do indeed recognize the man tottering up the stairs. Dots of blood line the floor, like a trail of breadcrumbs leading the way. The blood stains get bigger as I go up the stairs. It's a sign the man's getting weaker, which should normally be a good thing. That's why I think to myself, well, it should be fine. 
I've just become that desensitized to these sorts of armed conflicts. However, something's a little off about this particular situation. That's not going to help you, you know. The man doesn't react to my warning, leaving us at a stalemate. By the way, ham's delicious. I haven't had any in a while. Do you know of any good places to get ham? I've been living off of canned food lately. As you'd expect, the man just looks at me incredulously, as if to say, what's her problem? Now's your chance, um, whoever you are. Fire. That's the first word I ever hear from her. She says it so spontaneously, my body just naturally flows into motion. It's as if my body were built to respond to that voice command all along. Her voice is curious, but not for that reason alone. It's sweet. Metaphorically, I mean. No, wait, maybe that's only half true. Somehow, it really does feel sweet. It's kind of a strange sensation. Oh, um, don't mind me. I stare as steam pipes up from the cup of tea placed before me. The rim isn't chipped on this cup, obviously. The one who made the tea is the tall, adult woman who helped out during that scuffle. Her bangs cover her face, so I can't tell where she's looking or read her expression. At the very least, her lips look emotionless. She's honestly a little scary. Her stoicism and burly physique really contrast with the other girl's gentle smile and delicate figure. But what's the most striking about the burly woman is the gaping hole in her gut. It's the gunshot wound from the bullet that pierced through the man's body. I have no idea how much kinetic energy a bullet can maintain after piercing through a man's body, but in any case, the bullet pierced through her clothes and there's blood soaking around the hole. It can't just be a flesh wound. Yet she's completely calm, and she's not the only one. <laughs> Help yourself. The other girl is just as calm, sitting in what appears to be a somewhat high-tech wheelchair. I guess her legs aren't good. I guess her legs aren't good. The tire part of the wheelchair smoothly and easily moves across the rug without a problem. It seems like a pretty high-class item. Gamer chair. It must run on super magnetism or anti-gravity or something like that. Are those technologies commonplace now? I feel like they are, but I also feel like they're expensive. The other girl sits down a little bit away from us, abruptly rolls up her shirt, and exposes the gunshot wound on her stomach. Bleh. Oof. She then quickly takes a first aid kit out of a briefcase, and with a skilled hand, she quickly disinfects the wound and extracts the bullet with large tweezers. She's so calm and nonchalant, you'd think she was just popping a pimple. Um, are you okay? I call out to her without thinking. I'm the reason she got hurt, after all. Met. Um... My name. Don't worry about the injury. I trained. Miss Matt's voice is way more gentle than I imagined. It makes me kind of happy. Though I'd be happier if I didn't see the shiny red bullet in the tip of her tweezers. We're ghosts, after all. Even bullet wounds go back to normal before long. What's most important is to avoid immediate death. Huh. Oh, um, I'm... Sayako. Sayoko. I know. You're famous. Isn't that right, Matt? Famous indeed. Huh. I'm sitting on a sofa in a room just two floors above ours, trying to make myself as small as possible. Our entire room is smaller than just this living room. At least I think it's a living room. Is it still a living room if we're dead? Is this just how the top floor is? It's like the presidential suite of a hotel. Oh, I haven't introduced myself, have I? I'm Renata. I'd appreciate it if you just called me Renja. Okay, Renja and Miss Matt. I'm glad to have you as a new friend, Sayoko. Renja leans forward and reaches out her hand. I quickly take her hand so that she doesn't fall out of her wheelchair. Something smells so nice it makes me a little dizzy. What is that smell? I'm flustered, but she's just smiling at me from across the table as she hugs a pink plush toy that I feel like I've seen somewhere before, long ago. She's perfect. This is my room. 
I, uh, I see. She looks younger than me, younger than Anya, maybe around Clara's age. She seems more composed and mature than Clara, but she ends up looking to be the same age due to how she just won't let go of that plush toy. So I guess I can speak more casually with her. It'd feel a bit weird to act all formal with someone younger than me, after all. Or is that just my pride talking? After overthinking it, I end up stumbling my response. The kitchen's in another room, you see. I, I see. It might be a bit bigger than your room. You must be rich. It's because I make a lot of things, like what's on that plate. On top of the plate are sweets wrapped in a stylish plastic bag, something you'd expect to see at a brand name store. So, uh, I guess she sells sweets. Maybe that's how she earned her riches. I'd be happy if you drank that tea before it gets cold. It's more delicious when it's hot. Um... You're curious how I know about you, aren't you? It's because I've had my eye on you for quite some time, Sayako. You have such long, beautiful eyelashes. Okay. My heart skips a beat. Half out of joy and half out of surprise. Renja's got long eyelashes herself, and it seems like there's not a single flaw about her. I don't know how else to put it, but she's got an immaculate atmosphere to her. She's got the luxurious appearance of a princess, but the calm voice of a queen. She's refined and refreshing, like well-chilled imported mineral water that you'd find in a somewhat fancy supermarket by the station. That's very specific. Okay, that's a weird metaphor, but still. But your hair could use a little work. Do you do proper hair treatment when you take a bath? Um... Hair treatment. That sounds like such a foreign word to me. In fact, I only started to take baths when Pacifica and Anya told me to. But at least I'm better than Yoru, okay? She doesn't even take baths if you tell her to. I'll share what I use with you. Oh, no, uh, I couldn't. That way, our hair will smell the same. Ah. Uh, Renja looks at me with her reddish-brown eyes. I don't understand the meaning of her gaze. Despite Renja seemingly knowing everything about me, I have no idea how she feels at all. Oh, okay. You know, this tastes pretty good. For a powder, anyway. Living things do not exist in this town. And perhaps for that reason, most food products aren't fresh, but processed foods like smoked meat, sausages, or vacuum-sealed quick meals. We don't even drink coffee brewed from roasted beans, just freeze-dried instant coffee. I don't have many opportunities to drink tea, but this tea is probably made from powder rather than actual leaves. After hesitating for a moment, I take a sip. It's sweet. But the flavor doesn't leap out at me, it just vaguely tastes like expensive tea. It reminds me of some tea I had with a friend when we went to a tart stand inside a department store. I think. Wait, what's a department store? Thank you for saving me. Don't mention it. I mean, it was kind of my fault to begin with. You'll be my friend, won't you? Huh? I know it might sound weird for me to say this, but I just thought you were so cool and amazing back there, Sayoko. I would love to have a friend like you, Sayoko. That is, if you think I'd deserve it. You know, maybe some good can come out of pretending to be a ninja in some strange town in the middle of nowhere after all. I don't know how to say it, but this experience is special to me. You see, it'd make me very happy. Ah, <laughs> I'd be happy to. <laughs> we talk for a while after that. The way Renja speaks is different from the other ghosts I've met. She carefully and courteously chooses each individual word slowly but surely, as if carefully constructing a building. She leads the conversation so well, even I can keep up with her despite how I usually stumble at questions as simple as, How's the weather? As someone who's exhausted every day, this conversation is a blessing. 